The death toll is huge. The COVID-19 pandemic resulted in nearly 7 million deaths worldwide, according to the World Health Organization. These unprecedented times have also taken a toll on our psychological well-being. But culture, stigma, and access can make it an uphill fight to get help. I speak to scientist and psychologist, Dr. Alfie Breland Noble. Dr. Breland Noble, who also goes by Dr. Alfie, is the founder of the nonprofit Acoma Project. I spoke with her in our studios here in Washington, D.C. So can you talk about COVID, what it did to our mental health, and do you see mental health as the next pandemic? Yes. Um, so mental health was always an issue um, for all of us. I think what the pandemic did was shine a light on it in a slightly different way. Um, and the slightly different way was that it caused people to pay attention to something that had been hidden in the shadows for so long for so many people. Um, and I think that the other thing that the pandemic did was really sort of percolate and simmer and amplify some things that were already there. So I think these issues of depression, anxiety, social isolation um, were just exacerbated by the pandemic. And we then had this perfect storm, as I like to call it, of the amplification of these issues, the highlighting of these issues, as well as the exacerbation of these issues. Um, and so the pandemic just really did a number on all of us in terms of our mental health. And I think what we're gonna see coming out of this pandemic is that the next wave is going to be these sort of after effects, the after impact, sort of the uh, results of the exposure to trauma that people experienced by being isolated and locked away and not having the opportunity to hit developmental markers for our young people because they were at home and not in school. Um, so absolutely, that's going to be the next wave, I would say, of our pandemic. And absolutely, uh, the pandemic really did a number on our mental health. Dr. Alfie's nonprofit aims to meet the mental health needs of young people of color. The organization offers workshops, virtual counseling, and consulting. You have a nonprofit. Can you talk to us about its evolution, how you got into it? Sure. Oh, this, is, this is a great question. So the ACOMA Project, our name is spelled in all caps because it's an acronym. And it started when I was a professor at Michigan State University many, many years ago. And the idea was there are all these great treatments out there, but if people can't get in the seats to access the treatments, they can't benefit from them. Um, so back in 1999, I was at a conference, American Psychological Association, and then Surgeon General Dr. David Satcher put out this seminal report on mental health. And he's not a psychiatrist, he's not a mental health person, but he was somebody who saw that it was important. So of course, shouts out to our current Surgeon General, Dr. Vivek Murthy, who says the same thing, is very into mental health. And it got me to thinking about how can I help people access care because good care is out there. Um, culturally competent care is out there. Um, and that's how ACOMA was born. It was really focused on showing people what care is available, showing them the different forms, and then giving them an idea of what's the path to getting to it. So uh, fast forward 20 years. In 2019, we became a 501c3. I left academia. I like to tease I'm a recovering academic. Um, and when I left and founded the ACOMA Project, we really solidified and built our all of our work around three principles, raising consciousness, empowering people, and changing the system of mental health. And it's the same, we do the same work. We're research-based, which was really important to me as a health disparity scientist. And our goal is to ensure that everybody, right? One of the things we say is that every child, every young adult, deserves the right to live unapologetically and authentically as the best version of themselves. And one of the ways you get to that is by understanding and taking care of your mental health. So our goal is to empower young people, young adults, and then have those young people and young adults go back into their communities, particularly in diverse communities, underserved communities, and help the people they care about. Because it often sounds better coming from somebody you know personally, somebody who looks like you, who thinks like you, who talks like you, um, because that person can translate it in a way that maybe I can't translate it for that family member, abuela, or auntie, or tia, or, or whomever. So. That's what the Acoma Project's about. That's how we were founded, and it is my life's work, and it is one of the things of which I am most proud. You know, we talk a lot in this country about income inequality, yes. but when it comes to mental health, uh, there's an equal inequality there yes. too, and a huge disparity. Yes. Can you talk about that? Yes, so the disparities I like to share with people. I, I love how you preface this by talking about the income disparity. That's a part of it, 
That's a big part of it. That's not all of it. That's not even the primary driving factor. So when we think about epidemiological research, um, I, my master's degree is from the School of Medicine at Duke, and we studied, we talked about this stuff all the time, health econ. What you find is that for many un underserved communities, even when they have the money, people don't access care. And there are many reasons for that. One of the reasons that we know from the literature and from the research and from talking to people is that people worry about how they're going to be treated when they get into that mental health professional's chair because there are different outcomes uh, by different aspects of identity. We also know that our research literature has not done the best job of developing interventions and understanding mental illness across all different types of populations. So because of that, it's hard to create solutions across different populations if you don't understand the problems across different populations. So these are some of the things that we call psychosocial barriers. Other people call them social determinants of health. These are the things that keep people out of care, and these are the barriers that have nothing to do with money. And so the solutions really have to be focused on better understanding different people's perspectives on how they conceptualize mental illness, what feels palatable in terms of how they address it, um, and what feels sustainable in terms of what people have access to. Um, so those are some of the things around disparities and, and how underserved community, communities in many ways are kind of locked out of having the opportunity to access care even when they have money um, or insurance to pay for care. Although mental health has worsened overall, people of color reported more mental health issues since the pandemic started. According to a 2022 study by the Kaiser Family Foundation, suicide rates were rising faster among people of color compared to their white counterparts. People of color also face more barriers to accessing mental health care. Give us some insights, because most of us don't uh, live in your world, yeah. into the marginalized uh, people that you see. Yeah. Um, how desperate are they? Uh, what are some of the issues they're dealing with? Uh, yeah. and, and how troubled are they? So in 2022, we had a wonderful opportunity to put out an executive summary. And then in 2023, we put out a full, I don't know, a 42 page report called the State of Mental Health of Youth of Color. It focuses on youth and young adults between the ages of 12 and 25. And it's all young people of color, multiracial, black, African-American, Native American, Latino, Latine, and Asian American and Pacific Islander. We were very intentional, pretty equitably distributed across uh, those racial groups in the, in the sample. And of the close to 3,000 young people we surveyed, we learned things like about 77% of girls, including trans girls, report symptoms, moderate to severe symptoms of depression and anxiety. We learned that over 50% of all of our young people are reporting in general uh, severe to moderate depression, severe to moderate anxiety. Uh, about 20% of all of our young people in the survey reported exposure to racial trauma. And then we dug a little deeper and found things like when we think about the sources of racial trauma for many of these young people, for multiracial young people, I was really surprised by the highest percentage uh, of all the different sources was family members. Um, and so that kind of knowledge is important because that then gives you the opportunity to figure out where can you make a difference, right? So for some a multiracial young person, maybe part of the difference is teaching families how to have better conversations about these multiracial young people in their families. If they happen to be monoracial, but they have a niece or a nephew or a grandchild, maybe there's a different way they need to talk about race. Um, and so we can't do that if we don't ask these young people questions. So I think, you know, there were things that were not so surprising. Of all the young people we surveyed, African American and black young people were the most likely to report that the source of their source of their racial trauma, excuse me, was encounters with the police. Mm. Um, and so I think sometimes we think about, you know, for young people, well, what do they have to worry about? They're young. They're struggling with a lot. And then I think outside of our research, there are people have people who have done studies on climate change anxiety mm. and how for so many young generation Xers, um, in, I'm sorry, Gen Zers in particular, they're worried about the, the planet. Is the planet going to be here when they grow up and when they begin to have children? So they're dealing with a lot. And then we don't even have to get on social media and the exposures that come from being on social media constantly and comparing yourself and seeing all this news that you really don't need to be consuming because you don't necessarily have a way to digest it and cope with it. So, you know, it was very eye-opening for me, but it was also so important to be able to quantify 
what the lived experience is of young people, like directly from young people themselves. Stigma when it comes to mental health treatment is a huge issue. More than half of the people with a mental illness don't seek help or delay treatment because of it, according to the American Psychiatric Association. The APA says that although the public accepts a mental health disorder as a medical issue, many people still have a negative view of those with a mental illness. Let me talk to you about a stigma, which I think this is one of the things you talk about, which I think is fantastic, uh, an acknowledgement. Um, after on 9-11, on I witnessed the jet go into the Pentagon. It kind of messed with yes, my head. Yes. And a lot of people around me saw it, yes. but I didn't want to acknowledge it. Yes. And I think it's because of stigma. I mean, it's like, you don't want to say, oh, you know, but if you broke your arm, you wouldn't say, oh, no, I don't have a broken arm. Yes. Uh, how do we change it so that this and this can be connected? I think we have a great example from pretty much everybody under the age of 35. So when I think about young millennials, I think about Gen Zers. I happen to be a member of Gen X. Um, I was raised by baby boomers. And I think that what we see from them, the openness and the transparency, those are the things that are gonna be, you know, our North Star and the beacon for how we really help people understand that it is important and okay to talk about their mental health. It is mental illness and mental health are things that everybody is touched by, right? And so I think if you think about 60 years ago when people had cancer, they would kind of whisper, oh, I have cancer. And we don't have that kind of stigma attached to cancer now, but in part it's because so many people have been so open about their journeys. It's the same thing with mental health. When we watch people like Naomi Osaka or uh, the gymnast or, uh, uh, Kevin Love in, in basketball or football players, um, like the quarterback for the Dallas Cowboys, when we watch these folks talk openly, it gives other people permission. Um, and the permission is what people need because they need the permission to teach them that not being okay is an okay thing. Not being okay is normal. Um, and that nobody has it all together. So I think it's the conversations that are really gonna help us, these conversations on a national stage. Uh, I work closely with a, a young man, many people know Charlemagne the God, who's as a young African-American man, has been very open about his own journey. And so I think when people see that, they point to it and they say, that person reminds me of me, my brother, my sister, my aunt, my mom, my dad, my abuela. Um, and seeing that is what gives people permission to say, it's okay for me to not be okay as well. You look at the younger generation, you see hope, but you, you know, being the product of a baby boomer, um, the whole attitude of all baby boomers, every race was like, oh, just suck it up. It's not, and changing that. Yeah. And, and that's kind of drummed into us growing yes. up as well. Yes. Uh, having to change that dynamics, not easy. It's not, but I think where I have hope, I have to be honest and say, I'm, I've been saying for years, millennials really sort of gave me permission as a Gen Xer to acknowledge the things that I have to deal with as a woman of color, right? It's okay to say that I deal with some of these isms that, that other people who look like me and even those who don't look like me have to deal with. When I look at some of the social justice, like, like the, the cries for social justice that came out of the pandemic as well, witnessing what happened to George Floyd, witnessing uh, anti-Asian hate, um, those kinds of things, and having young people say, you know what, this impacts me. This is traumatizing me. I can't just sit and witness this through the news and through the media um, and, and say that it's not hurting me. So I think watching some of these young people say these things publicly has really given permission to Gen Xers and I think in some ways baby boomers to say, yeah, that's right. I don't have to just, as you said, that's what I heard too, suck it up. Pull, you, pull yourself up by your bootstraps and get over it. I think it really gave us permission and allowed us to widen our lens. And it gave us a community of people who, if we started to say things like, you know, 9-11 did kind of hurt me. I still remember where I was, you know, when, when the buildings came down and when it flew into the Pentagon, I remember all of that. And it's okay that I remember all of that. And there's a path for me to heal from that. So it really gave me permission to be able to do the things that I do and say the things that I say publicly. Um, and it helped me find a community to be able to say those things comfortably. The Acoma Project is working with researchers and institutions to collect data about youth of color on mental health. Dr. Alfie says there is an overall lack of research which is needed to inform policies. Okay, I'll give you a, a great analogy. In the early days of cardiology research, everything was based solely on men. And so our understanding of women's cardiovascular health 
was like an offshoot of what we learned about men. And then probably 40 years ago, somebody decided, yeah, maybe we need to understand if there are differences that women experience around their cardiovascular health. So you had this whole body of research that developed around women's cardiovascular health, and sure enough, you found that there are some differences, right? And so it's the same thing with mental health research. I think there's this idea that if we just understand it in one group, we'll understand it for everybody. The problem is everybody's experiences are not the same, right? So I think about things like immigration. How many generations has your family been in this country? Um, I think about things like language of origin. Everybody doesn't speak English as their first language. Um, I think about, like you talked about, socioeconomic status and what you have access to. So all of those things contribute to how we understand mental health, both how it shows up and manifests and how we treat it. And we have really failed to do a good job in the United States of understanding these issues for different populations. And that, in part, is why the ACOMA Project is grounded in research. We want to generate the knowledge to help us find the solutions so that everybody feels like they can see themselves in both the issues and in the solutions. Anybody who encounters me, anybody who encounters the ACOMA Project, you are going to feel like somebody sees you, somebody hears you, and somebody values who you are at your core. And I know that for many young people, we may be the only place they get that. And so that's what drives me. It is the idea that I can provide some kind of support for any young marginalized person, um, youth or young adult, and sometimes young at heart, um, in ways that they might not be getting it elsewhere. The big word here in Washington, D.C. is policy. There's a lot of policy wonks. Um, I'm sure if you could shake them a little bit, you'd probably tell them you need to change your, yes. your policies. Yes. Uh, give us some ideas. What direction should we be going in? Uh, the biggest one for policy change, and just reflecting on the question you asked before that, it is changing people's attitudes about why everybody's important. I think we get stuck in this idea of law and order is really for these people over here and mental health support is for these people over here. And I think the idea is to recognize the humanity in everyone. And so you think about the differences between how we, how we dealt with the crack epidemic, remember I'm an 80s, 90s kid, and how we dealt with the opioid ep epidemic. And if we really just stop to look at the policies as people who are struggling with addiction period. It doesn't matter what kind of substance it is. I think that can inform much better how we address policy. The other thing I want, always want people to do, um, which is something I learned from working with a woman named Representative Bonnie Watson Coleman. She's phenomenal. She's out of New Jersey in the House of Representatives um, nationally. And that is having the, the forethought and the foresight to say, I want everybody to have an opportunity to have access to good mental health care. And when you have people in public office who approach the work from that perspective, they're going to create bills, they're going to try to create laws, they're going to work on legislation to benefit us all. So if there's something I needed to say to policy people, I would say think about your constituents and the people in this country the same way you would about the family member that you love the most. That should inform how you lead with policy. And the final thing I'll say is we really, really, really need much more equity in terms of how we distribute federal funding around research. And that relates back to policy because, you know, Congress sets that budget for the NIH and some of these other institutions. And we need that budget to be funded equitably to other things. And we need to ensure that the people who have access to that funding to conduct the research and lead the work look like all of us because we all pay taxes. So the people who lead the work should look like all of us who pay those taxes. And what would the world look like if we could get that? Oh, gosh. You know what? I'm going to throw it way back. The world, to me, would look like the most beautiful, don't laugh, Benetton ad that I've ever seen. That's what the world would look like. And people who don't I know laughed. Benetton ads, yes, <laughs> people, you know Benetton ads. It's all these different, beautiful rainbow of all different kinds of people. They were so far ahead of their time. This is like the 80s and swatch watches and all that kind of stuff that you can look and you can see all kinds of people reflect it positively, kind of, it makes me teary to think about it, everywhere you look. And no, it's not, you know, kumbaya and holding hands and singing and happy all the time, but it certainly is more of everybody's humanity is sort of brought to the surface and amplified, and we engage with each other in a way that we see each other's true, genuine humanity, because that's the thing that ties us all together. So that's how this world would look if we could do some of what we talked about today. 
leave on that helpful note uh, and hopeful note, I should say. Dr. Alfie, thanks so much. Thank you.